So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from across Canada and around the world. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a whole bunch of new classes today, especially around Alberta. I think we have like every classroom in Alberta in today's program, over 100 classes registered. So welcome into all of you new friends. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world with over 50 monthly live free broadcasts, everything from cave divers to astronauts and so, so much more. So thank you guys for joining us. I know it's a strange time for teachers, so we really appreciate you coming in as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places from around the globe. Now today, I am thrilled and honored and privileged to get to introduce uh, a continue on of our Epic Epic Peak series. So we've been joined by people from all over the Epic Parks in Alberta, BC. We've gone to Jathra. We've learned about grizzlies and bats and ground squirrels and the Athabasca River and so much more. You can check out all of those programs on the link below on the screen. And today we're diving in with one of my very favorite topics, one we've only done one other time in five years here as an organization, and that is fire. Now, our relationship with fire, especially in national parks, has changed radically over the last few decades, and we are going to get a chance to learn today about what that looks like in Banff National Park, one of the most beautiful places, not just in Canada, but the entire world. So I am so excited to bring in Annie, a fire communications officer, joining us from Banff National Park to tell us that story, show some amazing pictures and videos, and get you guys as excited as I am. So so, without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Annie, and take Hi. us away. <laughs> Hi, bonjour, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about FIRE today. So, as Jesse said, my name is Annie McNeil, and I work for Parks Canada as a FIRE communications officer for Banff National Park. So, some of you guys may have been to Banff National Park before, while some of you maybe have not. So here is a beautiful picture of Banff National Park. And it is my job here to educate people about the important role that fire plays in our ecosystem. So I wanted to start things off today with a little bit of a fun exercise. So I wanna know what all of you guys think about when you think of fire. To help set the mood, I'm gonna show you a video of fire and I want you to write in the chat how you feel. Fantastic. So just a note for all our YouTube classes, if you guys want to share this in the chat, share what you think of fire for our StreamYard classes. You can share it in the StreamYard private chat. I'd love to see your answers over the next few seconds. Hmm. Get those typing fingers ready. What do we got coming into our warm? Okay. Our first, our first one. That's good. That's good. I, I feel toasty already just watching the clip. Dangerous. Okay. Burn. Nice. Anyone on of our YouTube classes, we've got Miss McCool's group, Miss Robinson, Miss Holly, all sorts of great groups from across the world. So Great answer so far from our stream. Feel like it means scores. Me too, grade six girls. Destructive. Very cool answers today. Good. Annie. Awesome, guys. Spreading fast. YouTube folks, feel free to share too. But this is a great start, Annie, if you want to keep going. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing, guys. So I did see some words come up, things like dangerous and scary and warm and hot and spreading fast. Um, so before we get started, like, please know that it's totally normal to feel this way. Um, fire can be scary. And especially if you live in areas that experience wildfires, because when fire reaches communities, it can have devastating results. So it's really understandable for people to fear fire. But I hope my presentation today will help you see fire in a new way. So before we had cities and highways, fire was actually a really natural part of life in the mountains. And believe it or not, it actually plays a really important role in our ecosystem. Fire can be important pro for providing food sources and habitat for all different kinds of wildlife. And in fact, in a little bit, I'm gonna explain about how Parks Canada has used fire in a safe way to help wildlife. But before Parks Canada was using fire, it's important to know that the indigenous people that first lived on these lands would use fire for all sorts of things, like creating trails to help with agriculture, attract certain animals, and for other cultural reasons as well. Um, and it's important to know that many nations continue to use fire on lands around our mountain national parks today. So before we dig in any further, let's first start by re respectfully acknowledging that Banff National Park is within the present day territories of the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 First Nations, as well as within the Métis Nation homeland. These lands and waters of Banff have been used for millennia by Indigenous people for substance, ceremony, and travel. And I am so grateful every day to have the honor of living and working on these lands. 
So before we get into animals, it's first important to understand a little bit of the history of fire. So like I just said, the indigenous people used fire on these lands for all sorts of different things, and they really understood it was a natural process. But when the European settlers came to the mountains and they started building towns, unlike the indigenous people, they were actually afraid of fire, just like some of you guys. Fire was not only scary, but it posed a threat to life and property, like the new houses that they just built. And for that reason, every time a fire popped up in the forest, people worked really hard to try and extinguish it and fight it before it could grow too big and too threatening. So because of this misunderstanding and fear that settlers had, fires were extinguished and they weren't allowed to burn in the forest. So for over a hundred years, fire disappeared from our forests. And this actually created a lot of problems over the years because we no longer had the good things that fire could actually give us. Basically what we had was like a puzzle with a missing piece because taking out the fire cycle meant that the whole picture of a healthy ecosystem was no longer complete. Without fire, it created a buildup of a lot of old trees and plants that grow really close together. And this is actually quite dangerous because fires can start more easily and they can spread more quickly with a landscape like this. And this buildup of old trees close together also creates a lot of shade. So it actually stops the sunlight from reaching the soil below. So this actually doesn't allow for a lot of different plants or trees to grow, which again makes it really easy for fire to ignite and it's just not good for our overall health of the ecosystem. Now it's important to know that old dense forest is an important habitat for some wildlife like caribou, but it becomes a problem when you only have this one type of forest and not lots of different types of forests and lots of different types of habitat. So let's take a look at Banff. So this here is a photo of Banff today. And you'll see in the box that I drew, there's dark green forest in the valley bottom. Um, it kind of looks like, to me anyways, it looks like these trees could be all the same species, the same size, maybe the same age, and they're all growing really close together. And believe it or not, but this is actually not natural. This is the result of not allowing wildfires to burn in our forests. Take a look at this second photo. So this is that exact same view of Banff, but a hundred years earlier. What differences do you guys see in the forest? Do you see some of the differences there? You'll see in this box that I drew that there might not be as many trees or dense forests. So, you know, these forests are more open, they're more sunny, um, and there's only sort of small little patches of dense forest. Um, and in fact, in that box, you could almost maybe guess that there could be maybe a bit of a meadow or a grassland in the valley. And so this is the result of allowing natural wildfires to burn in our forest. So like I said, fire can be a really important piece of the puzzle for our ecosystem. These fires are important because they clear out all of the old dead stuff and they bring in new life and new plants. It might actually help to think of fire as mother nature doing her spring cleaning. So every 50 to 100 years in the valley bottoms, the forest becomes old, full of spruce trees, lodgepole pine trees, and dead plant material on the ground. So when a spark ignites and a large fire moves through it, it actually cleans the forest floor of all the old dead stuff, and it can help to remove some of the trees, and it can help to space them out a little bit more. So afterwards, what is left is this beautiful mosaic that includes all different kinds of habitats, like open forest, where sun can reach the ground, um, and all of that dead plant material just gets um, burned and broken down and actually recycled back into the earth. And then mixed with all of that wonderful sunlight, it creates a fresh start for new plant life. And it's important to know that these new plants can be very yummy and delicious for all different kinds of animals. So remember that I work for Parks Canada for Banff National Park. Now, you guys might be thinking, first of all, what is Parks Canada and what does fire have to do with us? So um, a little bit of a definition for you guys. As Parks Canada staff, we work to protect and celebrate our natural and cultural heritage across Canada. So basically what this means is that we work to protect animals, plants, landscapes, and historical sites. And in addition to protecting these special areas, we also get to share and talk about them with people like you, kind of like I'm doing right now. 
Um, so Parks Canada protects 48 different national parks across Canada. So I want to know, have any of you guys visited these national, any of these national parks before? And if yes, which ones have you been to? Let me know in the chat. Ooh, so again, YouTube folks, I'm going to give you guys a second. I know it's a little bit delayed when you're tuning in on YouTube. Stream your class if you want to let us know where you've been to, uh, you have the chance to go to national parks. For me personally, I've been to Banff, I've been to Jasper. Gross Morn is one of my very favorite places out in Newfoundland. We've got our Banff and Jasper folks. We've got a lot of Alberta classes live today, so it's great to know you've been going to local national parks. Elk Island, awesome. Elk Island has bison, which is super, super cool. Some amazing awesome. Uh, Kluani. Kluani is exciting. That's exciting from our great six yeah. schools to live on uh, cool. Nice. All right. And then we got some Ontarians joining on uh, YouTube. Kaskwa in Northern Ontario. Mr. Dupuis class. Hmm. Any others? I wonder if anyone's ever been to the one at the very, very top of Nunavut there. Yeah. <laughs> Not <really. laughs> Uh, a little hard to get to. Banff and Jasper, Miss McCool's class. Great, Annie. This is awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I'm so happy to hear that you guys have visited some of these parks before. And it's really great to see that a lot of you guys have been to Banff actually before. So that's going to be fun. Um, my next question was going to say, I was going to ask, um, do you guys know where Banff is located on this map? Can you guess where I'm located right now on this map? I think you're all Alberta classes, dude. We got a lot of Edmonton folks and Coldale, Edson. There we go. The arrow helps a lot as well. Thank you. There, yeah. I'm giving it away to you guys. <laughs> um, so this is where Banff is. Um, and Banff is found in Alberta, which is where some of you guys are. Um, and it's found in the Rocky Mountains. So it's about an hour and a half drive west of the city of Calgary and a fun pack. Fun fact about this park is that it was Canada's very first national park, which is pretty cool. Um, but let's take a closer look at all the Canadian national parks that look after areas in the mountains. They're spread out across the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia, and there are about set or there are seven different national parks that work, work to protect this special area, and they're all a part of this amazing peak discovery series. Um, so let me show you where they all are on the map. So first we have Banff, which is where I am, which we just talked about. Um, but also in Alberta, we have Jasper National Park. We've got Waterton Lakes National Park. And then if we hop over to BC, we've got Yoho National Park, Kootenai National Park, Mount Revelstoke National Park, and Glacier National Park. So all seven of these national parks all work to protect areas that are within the mountains that run through Canada. And I might be biased because I live here, but the mountains are a pretty special place. It's home to a wide variety of animals like bears, bison, bighorn sheep, caribou, cougars, wolves, and even little guys like salamanders and pikas. Um, and it's important to know that fire is an important tool that we use to help protect and create a safe and ideal landscape for all of these little critters and different animals. So back in the 1980s, Parks Canada recognized that excluding fire actually created more problems. And this was the very start of our prescribed fire program. So our first prescribed fire was back in 1983 and we've been using them ever since. And what I mean when I say prescribed fire is that we intentionally light fires under very controlled conditions. We have like highly trained fire specialists that plan and carry out prescribed fires. So a prescription for a fire is how and where the fire will be. It also includes thinking about all the things that go into making a fire safe and working right. Things like the weather, the plants, and the landscape in the area that we want to burn. So it's important to know that a prescribed fire is really not as simple as lighting a match and starting a forest fire because that would be very dangerous and really hard to control. And we never want people to do that. Only special fire experts like Hillary here should ever be lighting these fires. So 
So I want you all to uh, take a moment and I want you to think about a time that you had to go visit the doctor. So the doctor might have examined you, asked you some questions and tried to figure out what was making you sick or not well. The doctor then will make a plan for how to make you feel better and they'll usually prescribe you some medicine and they'll tell you how often and how long you need to take it. And as long as you follow the doctor's instructions, you started to feel a little bit better. And prescribed fire is actually very similar to this. Our fire specialists want to help the forest get better. So they examine the forest and they try to figure out what the problems are. And they make a prescription for a carefully planned fire, including where, when, and how to burn. And if the fire is used really carefully after a lot of planning and research, it can be used to make the forest healthier, just like when a human takes their medicine. Now, I must say, some of the tools we use to start prescribed fires are much cooler than what a doctor prescribes. Our fire specialists use tools like a drip torch, aerial ignition devices, and a heli torch. Now, as cool as these tools are, fire can be really dangerous. So like I said, a lot of research and planning goes into writing prescribed fire plans, and the conditions have to be just right before we put fire on the ground. Remember, it's never as simple as lighting a match. So even though we use prescribed fires, it's important to know that there still are sometimes wildfires in our mountain national parks. And when these fires are started naturally, usually by lightning, um, they're sometimes allowed to burn. Sometimes we let them burn and sometimes our fire crews will monitor them and control them to help keep people safe. Now it's important to know the difference between a high intensity fire and a low intensity fire. A high intensity fire is oftentimes a wildfire. It burns really intensely and it can destroy a lot of the nutrients and they evaporate and they don't go back into the earth. But when we use prescribed fire, we control the fire. So we create more of a low intensity fire and this can be a lot healthier for the environment and the nutrients that we need for new plants and new growth are preserved and recycled back into the earth. So this photo that you see on the screen now is a photo of the Sawback Range in Banff. So this mountain range has been burned by different prescribed fires and it's been burned more than once. Um, but when you look at this photo, I want you guys to guess how many times do you think this area has been lit on fire? I'll give you a few minutes to take a really good look at this photo. Mm, okay, I'm going to bring it back up full screen. Anyone wants to share on YouTube StreamYard? I don't know. 72 is our first guess from our grade six squirrels. Okay, but now we've got options. we got answers pouring in before the options. Five, 72. Two, five, or 11. Nice. Oh, our grade six squirrels have gone from 72. Oh, back to five. Okay, now. you changed your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I love these answers, guys. And again, I know for our YouTube folks, it's a little bit delayed today, so feel free to come on in with your answers too. Five, 11, uh, no one's saying two. We, we're pretty much universal. It's one of the bigger numbers today. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see what the answer is. So believe it or not, but this area has been burned 11 times since 1984 in what we call units or blocks. So this sawback prescribed fire helped to restore natural wildlife habitat within Banff because burning lots of old closely growing trees, we were able to create a meadow. So you can see there's more of a meadow area in the photo here. So basically this meadow allows sun loving plants to grow. Plants like grass, buffalo berries, Douglas fir trees, and the threatened white bark pine tree have all benefited from this. And the reason why we burned this area so many times was that we actually did want to create this open meadow because open meadows are really good for grizzly bears, which we're just going to find out why in just a moment here. But to make sure we could create a meadow, we have to burn it a few more times because when the fire moves through the forest, some trees like the lodgepole pine tree release seeds. And then what happens is that these seeds are dropped into the newly open soil and little tree saplings will start to grow. So in order to keep this area free from trees, we need to burn it a few more times so that we can keep burning these saplings. So burning an area more than once is pretty normal. 
And also, it's important to know that recently burned areas actually attract wildlife to feed on these, this new growth and these new saplings. And like I said, bears in particular really love to feed on recently burned spots because bears love munching on sun-loving plants. So you'll see all those sun-loving plants at the bottom there. But there's one berry in particular that makes up a huge portion of the bear's diet, especially in the late summer. And that's the buffalo berry. So these berries are essential to a bear's survival because they're full of calories and they help them fill their bellies before the winter. So I want you all to imagine you're a hungry bear preparing for the winter, and I want you to guess how many berries you think you could eat in one day. Do you think you could eat 500 berries, 1,000 berries, or, or 250,000 berries? How many berries do you think you could eat? I'm just still just picturing all the kids watching this thinking that they're bears and it's glorious. So thank you for that. I don't know. Okay. A thousand is our, our first two. We've got 250,000. I'm going to say, wow, I think I could probably polish a thousand berries personally and a bear is a lot bigger than I am. And so we're starting to get a lot of the 250,000 range. Um, <laughs> that that might be your answer. We've got to mix again. No one's going for A. You, you, you can get rid of the A answers for all these things all together. We know <laughs> numbers. You don't trick us. <laughs> yeah. I'm not very tricky, I guess, today. <laughs> Good All out. right. Good on YouTube as well. That's our biggest answer. C. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys guessed C, not D, sorry. Um, that's correct. Um, so that's a lot of berries. And it's interesting to know that that would be the same amount of calories as if a person ate 65 hamburgers per day. So that's pretty crazy. So because these berries are so important to a bear's survival, they'll put up with a lot to be able to get the food that they need. And buffalo berries, like so many of the other plants that bears like to eat, tend to grow in sunny, open areas. And these sunny, open areas are often found alongside trails, beside the railway, beside the highway. And this just isn't good for bears because what it does is it draws them into areas where humans are, which puts them at risk for getting hurt by cars or trains or maybe get into trouble by eating human food. So finding new ways to help these bears survive is really important to us. And using fire to create meadows and better areas for them to find food is one of the ways we can help them. So I wanna talk about some more examples about how fire has helped wildlife in the mountain parks. But remember that each animal might need something different. So the way we use fire can vary depending on what's needed. So let's jump over to BC for a moment and go to Kootenai National Park. So along the southern border of Kootenai National Park lies an area of grassland and open forest. And what this means is that the forests are not as dense and they're not growing as closely together. They're more open. And Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep love to live in this type of habitat. Bighorn sheep are actually considered a species at risk in British Columbia, so Parks Canada works really hard to help them. And one of the ways we can help them is by uh, using prescribed fire to restore the grassland that they like to call home. So let me take a step back and explain a little bit more. So as areas around Kootenai National Park were getting sailed, settled by people, the landscape started to change. So remember that fires weren't allowed to burn. So a lot of this open meadow that the sheep love became filled with a lot of trees. So you'll notice, I'm sorry, these photos are really fuzzy, but you'll notice on the bottom, um, that photo, there's a lot more trees than the one on the top. So what we did was that starting in 2001, Parks Canada started using prescribed fire to restore these native grasslands and really open up the forest in this area. So this more open grassy landscape is absolutely loved by bighorn sheep because it has lots of grass for them to munch on and just a few trees here and there to help protect them from the weather. And these more open spaces also allow the sheep to spot predators coming so they can escape to nearby cliffs. And it's important to know that our team in Kootenai National Park still monitors, or they do monitor the sheep um, with cameras and tracking devices. And we can see that by reestablishing re the grassland with these prescribed fires, it has really helped them and they're doing a lot better today. So now let's jump over to Waterton Lakes National Park for another example. So they have also used prescribed fire to help restore grassland in their park. 
Rough fescue is a special kind of grass that grows in this area, and it's a really healthy food for animals, especially during the cold winter months. So this grass is an important source of food for all different animals, but especially for herds of elk that love to spend winter in the park. So without letting natural wildfires burn, over the years, a lot of trees like aspen and evergreen overtook this area. But since 2011, Parks Canada has implemented 20 prescribed fires to restore these rough fescue grasslands. One more example, let's jump over to Jasper National Park. So caribou are found in Jasper National Park and they're classified as an endangered species in Canada. So it's really, really important for us to try and help them. And one of the ways Parks Canada does this is through the use of caribou friendly prescribed fire plans. So what we do is that we protect the caribou by burning areas that are far away from their habitat. And what this does is it actually works to attract predators away from the caribou habitat. So before we jump back to Na Banff National Park for my last story, I want to see how well you guys remembered how fire can help the different animals in the mountains. So can you match the wildlife to the landscape that they need? So let me know in the chat what landscape you think a bear needs, what landscape an elk needs, and what landscape a bighorn sheep needs. Ooh, I also like how in the picture, the bear's eating one of the things in your options. Uh, <laughs> our big questions on YouTube. Okay, so folks, if you want to share what you think, A, B, C, bear, elk, sheep. Um, bear, C is like our, our universal coming in so far. Perfect. Okay, so that pretty down. We had a great question about if people can eat buffalo berries, and thanks to the BAM outreach team for being on, on the ball on Twitter. Elk is B, they say, and sheep is A. But we've also got elk A, sheep B, so there's some people are iffy on those. But bear being C is universal. Sheep A, elk A, sheep B, and it's all over the place. We, we confused them. You, you got the bear down, Annie, in the okay. patient's bit, which is really good. <laughs> YouTube, elk A and sheep B is the, the general funny feeling on YouTube. Okay, awesome. Okay. All right, well, here are the answers. So first, I think everyone got this one. So bears. So remember that fire helps to create meadows which is where a lot of buffalo berries and other sun-loving plants can grow. And this is important for bears because this is what they love to eat. And let's see if you got this one right. So elk, so remember that fires help to bring more rough fescue grasslands back to Waterton Lakes National Park, which is a special grass that can feed herds of elk through the winter. And lastly, remember how we're helping to protect bighorn sheep in Kootenai National Park. So fire has helped to reestablish grassland and open Douglas fir tree forests, which is where the bighorn sheep love to live. So good work, guys. So now we're going to jump back to Banff for one last story. So we've been talking a lot about bigger, more exciting animals, but I love the little guys. So let's talk about salamanders. So the long-toed salamander is a pretty cool animal, and they're listed as sensitive by the Alberta provincial government, which means they also need our help. So in 2014, we did our 11th burn of the Sawback area in Banff National Park. So remember this area that we burned 11 times? So what it did was it created ideal conditions, which were a lot of burned and rotted out tree roots. And salamanders love to find holes for hibernation. And now there were tons of places for them to live. So we've seen a huge increase in salamanders in this area now. And so much so that we actually have to remind people to watch out for them crossing the road. <laughs> we actually use signs like this. So to wrap up, we've seen that fire is important to all different kinds of animals and fire can help to create different kinds of habitat and food for wildlife. Um, and in all the mountain national parks, Parks Canada works with fire to keep these special places healthy. And when we do work with fire, it's carefully planned out and carried out to make sure that we keep everybody safe. So before we finish, I want you guys to share with me some things that you've learned about fire. So what do you think about now when I use the word fire? Has anything changed for you guys? I'll bring up that same photo or uh, video to help uh, help set the mood again. 
Fantastic. Amy, this is so much fun. And for our classes too, I hope you guys are getting your questions ready as well. But in the meantime, we'd love to hear what you guys think about fire. It helps the environment helpful. The grade six squirrels still think that it's hot. They are totally correct in that. Uh, helps animals. And it burns. Yes, it does. Uh, you too, folks, if you guys want to chime in as well. But again, the helpful element of this is really important. I think so many of us go into with thinking about fire as a universally destructive force. And again, when it's controlled, Good. some of our classes are talking about that. It can be a real benefit to a lot of uh, ecosystems and species. Um, I love fire. It's good and bad, beautiful from Mr. Please class. Burns, but in a good way. These are You guys are great today. Important to our system. Fantastic class participation. I love it. Awesome. Uh, Great. Lots of good answers, guys. Thank you so much. Um, so looks, sounds, and looks like you guys have some really good things to say about fire now. So that makes me really happy, and that's really good to see. Um, so remember that when one piece of our park, like the fire cycle, is missing, all the other processes and species are affected. So help us spread the word about the importance of prescribed fire with your friends and family. So I hope you all have a new appreciation for the important role that fire plays in our ecosystem. And now I'm ready to answer any questions you guys have. Um, and just know I'm new to the fire team. So if I don't have the answer, I promise I will get it for you. Annie, that was spectacular. Thank you so, so much. And again, I'm so excited for everyone's questions. That was also the all time record for the most slides gotten through in a 30 minute period. So bravo for you. Uh, we're gonna dive in, folks. So we've got our live classes joining us from all over Alberta. We've got groups all over North America on YouTube. I look forward to YouTube questions. Please share in the chat there. Um, but let's begin with one of our live classes. So we are gonna head to Miss Johnson's class. They're joining us in Edson, Alberta, grade fours. If you guys wanna kick us off with a question for Annie, you are good to go. Hi, guys. Hey. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> no hurry, all good. <laughs> Don't run. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering, um, does, does, is it a bad thing if you see, like, fire that's, like, all around the forest? Yeah, so if you were like to be driving along, Annie, and you're in Banff, and you suddenly see a whole bunch of fire happening all at once, is that a bad thing? Should you tell somebody what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes in the spring and the fall, we do pre our prescribed burns around that time. So when you're driving through, you might see flames. Um, there are a few fires that we want to do this year that might be close to the road, so you might see them. Um, but we'll have signs up. So if, if it's a prescribed fire and we're doing it to help the forest, we'll have some signs up. So we'll make sure that we let you know, don't worry, our team is, is taking care of this fire. Um, but if you don't see the signs, definitely please call us you can call our Banff dispatch number um, and uh, and we can make sure that it's not a wildfire. Great first question, guys. All yeah. right, let's head to Edmonton to North Mount grade sixes. If you guys want to unmute your mic, make sure all our live classes unmute your mics, so you're all good to go. Come on in. Hey, guys. Um, my question is, how long would they spread the fires? Yeah. How long? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, so sometimes it could just, our prescribed fires, they could just be a couple days. Sometimes they're a couple weeks. It really just depends on the fire and what the forest needs and also could really depend on the weather. So if it's really, um, really wet, like maybe we need a few more days to do it. So yeah, there's a lot of different factors. So it can range from a few days to a few weeks. It just depends. Great question, and I love the ones coming in on YouTube. I'm going to get to those in just a sec, but first we're going to go to our grade six squirrels, Miss Bond's class, also joining us at Edmonton. Do you want to come on in? Hey guys, welcome in. Yes. Hi. I'm Mr. Squirrel, and I have a question. Okay. <laughs> you tell. <laughs> Has the squirrel, the squirrel forgotten? Do any animals get hurt while you're burning the fires? Great question. We had this in our first Parks Canada fire presentation too, so I'm really glad you asked that. Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's important to know that when we do our prescribed fires, 
animals are actually pretty smart and they know that fire is part of the natural cycle of life and the natural ecosystem. Um, so they're pretty smart and they can sense fire and they can usually, a lot of them will just like leave the area. So the bears will leave, the birds will fly away and sometimes mice or other rodents will actually bury themselves into the ground um, and hang out there until the fire's over. So when we're doing prescribed fires, usually animals don't get hurt. They usually get out of the way and they, they know. Yeah. Great question, though. And I love that it was asked by a squirrel itself. By the way, if you guys are <laughs> out squirrels, if you go to our peak series, there was a giant sentient English speaking ground squirrel that came in in one of the programs. Just as a heads up, you want to go to our peak series. It's a lot of fun on YouTube. Uh, let's head to Miss Robinson's class. Joining us in Red Deer. Hi, guys. Okay. Come on in and uh, go for it. Oh, hold on. Yeah, you're good. Um, what is happening with the BC fires right now? Ah, the BC fires right now, Annie. Yeah, right now, um, right now there's no fires at the moment, but um, yeah, we're all sort of ready um for fire season. So yeah, we're ready, we're ready to help. But right now, there's nothing really going on. Right now, there's lots of snow, so that's good. <laughs> Winter keeps us away from natural disasters for a little bit. It's really interesting thinking about what it's been like for kids growing up. I mean, when I was a kid, there were fires across Canada, but nowhere near to the degree that we see them now in so many parks and in places coast to coast. And so it's really important that we, again, have really well prescribed fire management practices. It's really important that we educate people on the importance of this as a, as a tool to help, you know, save habitats, save cities and communities. And, and I'm really glad we got that question. So thanks, guys. All right. Quick note for everyone too, we've already got more questions on YouTube than we can possibly answer in one broadcast. So I am gonna to head to our YouTube friends in just a second, but I do wanna note, we are gonna have a Padlet after this program. We always do these after Parks Canada programs. So I'll make sure our YouTube friends have this link as well, but you'll be able to share additional questions after the broadcast and get Annie and the Parks Canada team answering them as well. But in lieu of that for now, let's head to Miss Robinson's class asked us our last question. Abby wants to know how high the flames of the fire get. How big a fire are you creating when you do these prescribed burns? Yeah, typically our prescribed fires aren't too crazy and aren't too high. Usually they're pretty low. So like you saw in that video with Hillary, um, things don't get too wild. But um, yeah, it very it really depends. Um, I, I can find that exact answer for you from our fire team and get back to you on that for sure. Fantastic. Um, so we got a question that's been sort of repeated a whole bunch on YouTube. Tyler and Javier in uh, North Hollywood, California. Mr. Pedix's class have this. Shelby wants to know this in Mr. Shattuck's Chalk River class. So how long does it take to put out a fire? And do you put out the fire? Like, do you go and actually smother it? Or do you just let it be and know how it's going to progress? What's going on? Yeah, so we do let the fire kind of do its thing and we watch it. And and like I said, like there's a lot of research and, and, and planning that goes into the fi the plans. So yeah, our teams kind of like, they can usually guess and anticipate how the fire is going to react and we'll let it burn. We'll let it burn. Um, um, and then sort of when it has done the thing that it needs us to do, then we, we have sprinkler systems and we will put it out. We've... Uh, uh I, I'm going to head back to our live classes in just a minute. We're getting so many great questions. You guys rock. So Miss Gail wants to know, sort of on that note, grade five students want to know, has a prescribed fire ever gone wrong? Have you ever, like, did you ever learn your lessons the hard way when it came to doing these birds? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, things can go wrong all the time. Um, but like I said, we put a lot of research and effort into our plans. So usually we're quite cautious. Um, there has been prescribed fires where, you know, we thought it was going to rain. So we're like, oh, it's the perfect time to do our fire. And then that rain never comes. So then we end up having to sort of like watch that fire and make sure it doesn't grow too big or, or cause any issues. Um, but the good thing is that these are low intensity fires and that we sort of know how they're going to react. So our teams are able to respond. So nothing's ever gotten way out of hand, but definitely sometimes, you know, the weather doesn't always cooperate with us. So yeah, it, it just, yeah, it can really depend sometimes. Our lesson as humanity over the last several hundred years, sometimes it's difficult to predict what will happen with natural phenomena, but uh, again, a lot of work goes into this. So I, I want to share one more quick question on YouTube. It's a pretty easy one. Ms. Harvey's class wants to know, do they prescribe burns in highly populated areas or how would they go about that? Any prescribed burns right at the end of Banff Avenue or, or never? <laughs> 
No. So that's a really great question. So usually our, our prescribed burns can happen around the community for sure. We'll never do a burn in the town of Banff. Um, we, we work with the town of Banff um, to do a lot of our wilds, our, our fire smart work. So basically, you know, we'll do we'll remove all of that dead bush and and uh, we'll call it fuel. So anything that really fuels a fire if it was to work through. So we'll do we'll do some of that clearing and stuff like that in the town, um, but we won't do a full prescribed fire. Usually we'll do those sort of like around the community or sometimes they're in the remote back country. Yeah. So you won't even see them. Fantastic. I've been through Banff National Park where they're prescribed burns on the go, but it wasn't right near the town. It was when you were, you know, you're trying to prevent the town being in a situation where it could be in danger from exactly. a fire. It'll be on the outskirts of it to prevent it. And we got a chance to see some of that today. Guys, that was great. I've shared the Padlet link for all our YouTube classes, so please do feel free to share more questions there. But let's head back to Ms. Johnson's class and keep this going with our live groups for one more round. Ms. Johnson's group, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dominic, in the back. Here, high. <laughs> if the animals go down underground, if they don't go underground too much, how will the fire get them? Yeah, so another animal concern question. Any animal? That yeah, for sure. Yeah. If you know, if, if they don't leave the area or they don't bury themselves in time, definitely sometimes that can happen. Um, but really, that's just the natural part of our ecosystem. And sometimes that that happens. And, and animals know that too, right? The fire is just a natural cycle. And yeah, unfortunately, that does happen. But usually most of the time it doesn't. So well, so just like we're trying to help, you know, human communities by doing these prescribed fires, animal communities benefit from these being a, a small targeted thing as opposed to something that can blaze out of control. I think we all saw yeah. that, especially with Australia, uh, I guess a little over a year ago now, where you had huge tracts of ecosystem that burned up because they'd never had these prescribed burns. They'd never yeah. had them that, you know, made it so that you're, you're potentially saving some of those animals. So I love that there's so much concern for animals. Anytime you have a phenomenon like this, um, you're probably going to have a little loss of life, but the whole point is to make sure that there's little as possible and that it's mm -hmm. done in a yeah, con conservation-minded way. So great question, guys. All right, North Mount, grade six is come on back. <laughs> um, what do you do when if you can't control the fire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, usually... Well, I, I'll yeah. Usually our teams will be able to control the fire. I don't know any examples where we haven't been able to control it, but um, our teams definitely have the sprinkler systems. They're ready to go. Um, they know how the fire is going to react, um, and they're prepared for it. So we've never actually had to worry about that. Um, but that's not to say it can't happen sometimes. But um, our team usually is pretty prepared, and they they know how the fire is going to react. Yeah. I love the concept. We didn't talk about this too much today. I mean, we talked about putting fires out with sprinkler systems and letting them burn and making sure you're, you're good that way. Fighting fire with fire is a tactic that you see in some wildfires sometimes, which is really cool as well. Not something that necessarily comes into play in these managed fires, but I do encourage classes to look it up as a tool for fighting fires in the world. It's so, so cool to think about. So great question, guys. All right, grade six squirrels. And I'm fully expecting the squirrel plushie to make a comeback. I'm just letting you guys know. Uh, but yeah, come on oh, back. Oh, and oh, oh, right, we're up, we're up, we're, we're up. up. Okay. We're up, we're up, uh, come on. Yeah. One second, we've got, we're having some uh, technical difficulties right now. Oh, no. uh, yes. I'm technical sure. Difficulties. Okay. Okay. Just talk. Uh, oh, okay, oh. go. What kind of protective equipment do you need when you're starting the fires? Great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah, so our team wears um, clothing um, and they've got helmets. Um, they've got mitts. They've got boots. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, protective equipment uh, that goes into this. Um, actually, my, my friend Emily is here as well. Emily, do you know any more of the specifics around their equipment that they wear? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, well, the firefighters wear a special kind of fabric called Nomex, and that's what their shirt and their pants are made of. And it's a, it's a, it's, it looks like cotton and feels a little bit like cotton. This is a Nomex shirt here, but it's a special fire resistant fabric that they wear all over. They have really special glasses, earmuffs, because a firefighter always has a chainsaw close by. So we want to make sure that their ears are protected. A special helmet as well with a visor 
and really, really um, tough hiking boots because they're on all sorts of terrain. Fantastic. <laughs> so I've got Nomex up there. If people want to look that up after the fact as well. And I don't know if this will be featured in the site, but I know some of our classes might need to go in a minute before our last question. So I did want to highlight there's a fantastic website if you want to learn more about how BAMF fights fires, how they do these managed fires. So pc.gc.ca slash BAMF hyphen fire. Check that out. I'll put it in our YouTube chat as well. So Emily, thank you for popping in. That was great. <laughs> All yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, let's head to Ms. Robinson's class for one last question to wrap us up. Uh, come on in, guys, and take us away. Hey there, you guys have a final question. Oh, maybe. maybe. No, I don't think so. No, that's okay. No worries. You know what? I'll take one more quick one from you two before we wrap up and say goodbye with everyone then. Uh, let's see. Oh, Miss Gail wanted to know, do you start more than one fire in a day ever, Annie? No, no. so usually we'll focus on one at a time. Yeah, <laughs> that which sort of feeds into some of those other questions about making sure they don't get out of control. If you've got your whole team dedicated to one fire, you avoid that being an issue. Uh, this has been so, so much fun. Sorry, a little bit of a frog in my throat, but I do want to highlight that again, people can share more questions, padlet.com with our, our thing and fire. I put that in the YouTube chat for our groups that want to learn more. <clears throat> There's our, our BAMP Fire website for you guys to check out. And of course, if you want to join us for more of this Epic Peak series, we have got there it is somewhere somewhere in my banner list. Our, our peak programs, we've got another one coming up in mid-February for your French colleagues. Tomorrow we're going to be doing another one on fire. So you want to come on in and tune into that. It'll be a lot of fun. But check out our peak series for all our past sessions and all our upcoming ones to come over the months uh, from now on. Annie, this is so much fun. Is there any last message you want to leave all our classes with uh, about fire and, and all you guys do at BAM? Yeah, thank you guys so much. I just I hope you guys all learned some new things and and have a new appreciation for for wildfire or for prescribed fires in our na mountain national parks. Fantastic. Well, Annie, first time joining us, I want to make sure that all of our classes have a chance to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Miss Johnson's class, North Mount Grade Six Squirrels, and Miss Robinson, if you want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye, come on in.